It is Friday, October the 29th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast exploring social, economic, political, and geopolitical issues. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today. That means I have the great honor of sharing the stage with three very wise men who we jokingly call Hoover's Goodfellows. That would be the economist John Cochran. Geostrategist slash hopeless optimist, H.R. McMaster. <laughs> and historian and author, Neil Ferguson, Hoover Institution Senior Fellows All. So those of you watching this, uh, the applause you hear, we're recording this live in the, tr uh, in the Trey Tail building of the Hoover Institution here on the campus of Stanford University at what the Hoover Institution calls its fall retreat. So this will explain the hopefully uh, numerous rounds of applause you'll hear over the course of the next 50 minutes. So gentlemen, good to see you. It's nine o'clock on the West Coast and HR, what comes to mind is the army ads from years ago, be all you can be. Remember there was one that had the tagline, we do more before 9 a.m. than you do in a day. <laughs> <laughs> so question to the three of you, you all are early risers, you all are very prolific. What have you typically done on a work day by nine o'clock in the morning? <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think it helps to be on the West Coast. So typically yeah, I'm on the phone or Zooming, right? Like all of us are uh, to, people on the, to people on the East Coast. And, and I try to, you know, I think I'm more productive writing in the morning. So I try to not do as many calls in the morning whenever I can and then, uh, and then try, to, try to write. But, uh, you know, it, I never understood why that commercial appealed to 17 and 18 year olds, right? <laughs> so I don't know how effective that advertising campaign was. <laughs> John, is the Grumpy Economist blog up and running at nine o'clock in the morning? Or are you still percolating at night? Uh, sometimes. You, you, do you really want the world to know how boring our lives are? You know, get up, <laughs> speak for yourself. Read, read the Wall Street Journal, have breakfast, exercise, blog, write, have lunch. That's life. Rinse and repeat. Groundhog Day. <laughs> Neil Ferguson, you're never boring. What are you typically done by nine o'clock? I tend to get up somewhere between four and five because, I mean, the rest of the world is already up if you're in California. You're basically playing catch up all morning. Uh, this, and then I do some reading uh, after playing whack-a-mole with email. Uh, <laughs> this morning I read about the Democrats' plans uh, for taxation, yes. which made me feel so ill. I basically couldn't eat my breakfast. Uh, but, but unlike these gentlemen, I, I have uh, small children still, so there comes a moment when I have to sound the reveille and get uh, two small boys, uh, Thomas and Campbell, aged nine and four, out of bed. Uh, and each morning I, I play a different bit of music to motivate them for the day ahead. Uh, and this morning it was the Monster Mash, because it's Halloween. I don't know if you realize this, but <laughs> Halloween mania is sweeping that age group. And so we had a big fight about who was wearing which costume. It's quite exhausting. I'm amazed I'm here. I feel like I should be ready to go to bed at this point. Is the day <laughs> over? It's like, oh my God, it's only 10 past nine. It's a song by Bobby Boris, I think. And Boris Karloff is in it, isn't he? Yeah, we don't usually talk about such lowbrow popular <laughs> culture. Normally it's the Grateful Dead. Uh, but yes, uh, the Monster Mash, highly recommend. Very popular when I was a kid at Halloween. The boys were not that enthused, but you know, I try. Very good. All right, uh, since we're sitting here uh, in this uh, lovely auditorium here in the Hoover Institution, why don't we start the show by talking a bit about the role of think tanks uh, in 2021. What caught my eye was actually a piece in The Economist that ran two years ago. Uh, the headline, Can Think Tanks Survive in a Post-Fact World? And I think what they were getting at, think tanks are populated by pointy-headed academics, uh, many of whom didn't see Brexit coming, didn't see Donald Trump coming. Maybe they don't see the world the way they should be. So let's talk about the relevancy of think tanks these days. Well, let me begin by saying that in, in, in many ways, Hoover is not a think tank in the conventional sense. I mean, we are uh, a, a strange hybrid entity, which is part academic center at the center of the campus of one of the world's leading universities. But unlike many academic institutions, we are interested in policy. So we want our findings to become actionable. And I think in that sense, Hoover occupies a completely unique position that sets it apart from the Washington-based think tanks, uh, particularly at a time when academia has swung so far to the left uh, that uh, most of the people uh, sitting here today would be absolutely staggered by the things that go on on a typical campus. We're, we're in the unique position that we can at least offer some antidote to rampant wokeism and identity politics. So I, I, I think Hoover's not really a think tank in the sa same way that the American Enterprise Institute or Heritage are, th are think tanks, because we're really trying to make 
academic research, the most sophisticated research on economics, uh, on history, on international relations, we're trying to make it relevant to the people who have to make the decisions, uh, whether it's in Washington or further afield, because I don't think our scope is purely the United States. I would say I think that's the key, is, is the connection between scholarship and then having really a in positive influence on policy, but then also education. Because I think one of the ways that we get out of the kind of mess that we're in in terms of the, the lack of strategic competence we've seen in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere is for the American people to demand better from their leaders. And so I, I, think, uh, I think Hoover's uniquely positioned to do that. Uh, I think the other problem sometimes you see with, with, some, with some think tanks is they become very superficial. They're trying to have immediate policy impact uh, with essays that may or may not be, or events and discussions that may or may not be grounded in rigorous academic research. So we have a tremendous opportunity to do that here. We have amazing students here, uh, obviously, at Stanford. And the opportunity to work with them as research assistants, it, it's, it's like a, a continuous ongoing seminar with research assistance as well as we, as we examine the greatest challenges and opportunities we're facing uh, internationally or economically. So I, I do think we have some really unique advantages just based on where we're sitting right now, but also the, our, our colleagues. I mean, I, I really, you know, we shot our show at the Senior Commons uh, the other day, which is back alive, you know, we're being able to get together again. And the, the, ability, the ability to share and borrow ideas freely across disciplines within a, an institution like this, I think is immensely powerful and it was, it's been part of my continuing self-education. So I would say um, if we are in a post-fact world, it's because people choose to live in a post-fact world. Uh, we are in a dysfunctional partisan world where most people choose to be post-fact. So where do we fit in? I think there's a conventional view of think tanks that our job is to whisper wisdom into the ear of the emperor. Uh, to help the policy makers make, make policy more wisely as if you know, they don't know uh, what to do, which often is the case. Um, and that, 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 is a important, that was an important function of think tanks back when there were people in, there were policy makers who needed technical help with you know, how do you make a tax code work uh, or things like that. But I think um, in our current world, there's a very important role for us. There's two important. One, um, as Neil alluded to, we are the medieval monastery during the Dark Ages that keeps the wisdom alive. And we don't just transcribe it, we, we improve on it. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're, when the world is ready, uh, we're here. But also, I think it's a mistake to think, we, we live in a democracy. Uh, and it's a mistake to think of our political system as there is the policy maker and we whisper in his or her ear and good policy gets made. No, we're a democracy. And what matters, the way there are the people who are making policy, around them there are the chattering classes, those who read op-ed pages of New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and, and come to events like this and care about public affairs. And then there are the vast mass of voters. And things, uh, politicians that I've met are, are actually quite smart and quite knowledgeable, but they, uh, you know, they're constrained by the ideas of the people around them. So when the ideas of the chattering classes are completely nuts, things are gonna go bad. And that's, I think, our, our, our right now, our prime. We want the, the educated, what used to be called the elite of ideas to have better ideas, because that's the only way good things are gonna come. And I'll just give one example. Um, I think one of our great successes was Milton Friedman's voucher essay in what, 1960 whatever? Now, it didn't, he didn't give it to some governor who said, oh great, we'll do vouchers. But that idea has slowly spread through, uh, and, and through much more research. Uh, you know, Rick Hanischek keeps working on it, on it now and is taking over because people understand, oh yeah, I should have the right to say where the money for my kids goes, what school it goes to. Uh, that's the kind of long-run influence I think we aspire to and, and the, the main mechanism, which combines scholarship, research, and outreach. But, I mean, let me add one thing very briefly uh, to what John just said. I agree with it all. But I think part of what we've learned from doing Goodfellows is that we can reach folks all over the country and, and all around the world who, who don't belong to the elite but do want to be informed about policy and do want to get fresh ideas. So for me, an exciting departure, and it was an unintended consequence of how we responded to the pandemic, is that we're reaching way more people than, than we used to, and we're no longer confining ourselves to conversations 
with members of the political elite. And frankly, I think what's really refreshing is, is the kind of communications we get from people all over the place responding uh, to what we're discussing on these, on these shows. So I think we're becoming an institution with a much greater reach than, than we used to have, precisely because we no longer target exclusively the elite or the chattering classes. Now, the three of you write in the here and now. You write about current events. You write books. You testify to Congress. You have a lot of phone calls with people of influence. What, what area do you feel like you have particular impact in? Is it, is it a Bloomberg column, Neil? Is it a book? Is it just taking a phone call from a, from a policy influencer? Where do you feel you have impact? The way to think about this is that there is this very, very hard process of, of coming up with answers to difficult questions. And in my case as an historian, that usually means writing a, a book far too long for anybody to read it from cover to cover. And I, rec I recognize that, 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 that a book is now essentially a decoration in an office or in a, a, in a home. Uh, the, the number of people who actually got through volume one of, of my biography, Kissinger was probably quite, quite small, but that's okay. I have to do that work. That is essential as the foundation for everything that I do after that. What I do then is I'll start writing some shorter articles. There'll be something in foreign affairs or some other place like that. And then you get to the next level, which is the op-ed in the Wall Street Journal or wherever it happens to be. I've done television. I did a PBS series just a, a, a year or so ago. And ultimately, uh, when we have conversations like this or in other podcasts, I think that's the sort of final product. So you kind of are building layers on top of that base of, of primary research. And ultimately, you get it to the point where you can express your most sophisticated idea in a tweet. I know that's a terrible thing to admit to, <laughs> but you do, if, I've always said this to maybe students. Maybe a thread, if, maybe a thread. Maybe a thread, but I, you know, I, still, I still like the art form of the single tweet. The, the point is, if you can't express an idea, and I've said this to students for 25 years plus, if you can't express your thesis in a single sentence, you're not ready to start writing. And, and also, if you can't express it in a single sentence, don't expect large numbers of people to know what you're on about. And many academics never see that and indeed make a virtue of speaking at excessive length and in obscure language. And, and Hoover is against that. And I'm, that's why I'm so proud to be part of this institution, because we are always striving to make it clear, to make it intelligible. Talk to anyone in Washington, you know, the staffers. What will they tell you? We're super busy. We can't read a 500-page book. Just give us an abstract. I think that's healthy. And that's, and that's one of the strengths of Hoover. We, we don't produce the unintelligible, or at least once we've done the unintelligible, then we produce the tweet. <laughs> or, or the superficial. I think one of the reasons why we are increasingly polarized, one of the many reasons, is, is the superficiality of, of discussions. And I think the people who are most vitriolic and adamant about most extreme positions on both sides are oftentimes those who know the least about, about issues. And I think the point that Neil uh, made is, is really important about the, you know, before you can bulletize something, you have to have done the, the research and the thinking and the reading and the discussing uh, to, to ensure that you have confidence, really, in, 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 the, in that sort of compressed version of your scholarship. And, and to have the opportunity to do that is a real gift. You know, it is kind of like a monastery, but it's, as Neil said, it's kind of more fun. It's, it's a fun monastery, I guess. What you guys are pointing out is the importance <laughs> of continued engagement. You don't just write one thing and that's that, right. but you engage continually over a range of topics on many platforms. Because ultimately what we want is the average American, when there's a crisis and somebody says, well, the government should just send us all checks, that'll be easy, to, to have understood the philosophy, <laughs> to have understood the larger way of thinking about things and not to need to call us to give them exactly a 10 bullet point plan on why that might not be such a good idea. It's also worth noting that we, we may do this uh, show on a regular basis, but what you don't see is the, the really hard work of reading one another's stuff in manuscript. My last book, Doom, was so much improved by, by John's comments. I mean, he read it like I was some slightly wayward graduate student. It was so much improved, I almost gave him a co-authorship credit. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a really big part of why we are a strong institution. There's lots of collaborative work uh, Condi Rice talked about that to some of us at lunch yesterday. I couldn't agree more. So yeah, this is the sort of fun part of the monastery, no question. Uh, eventually we'll get to shoot it in a good bar. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day when we find that bar. But, but in truth, there's a lot of quite wonkish stuff going on uh, that you don't see, uh, which involves plowing through the sort of not quite fully baked manuscripts of your, 
of your colleagues and doing it in, in an interdisciplinary way. I'm an economic historian, not an economist. I've learned so much uh, from John over the years. I'm somebody who writes about war but would never go near a battlefield because I'd be killed immediately. Uh, so I actually, you know, I've learned a huge amount from HR. We had a conversation just the other night over dinner about some of his combat experiences. If you're trying to write about war but you've never been nearer uh, to a battlefield than your armchair, you need a colleague like this who's seen real action. I, I just want to add too, so everything is a conversation. Scholarship is a conversation uh, among us and uh, between us and the policymakers or the uh, educated, thoughtful citizens of the country. And we get the engagement we get about at Hoover is not just one direction, it's the other direction. And you have to engage in policy and listen and understand the concerns of people, uh, people on the other side of your own political preferences as well, uh, to try and say, okay, here's what you're concerned about. Let's talk about, we're, we're all concerned, how can we get there? Uh, you have to listen and, and have a conversation in all dimensions. And that's another great part about being at a think tank. I didn't, I didn't meet people in policy back when I was in a department anywhere near like I do here. And I think it's an example, I know Bill, we probably want to move on to something, but I, I think, again, we are in the middle of Stanford University. The opportunity to interact with students is just phenomenal, whether it's teaching courses, but as I mentioned, our, our research assistants, who themselves are having big policy impact, helping to draft legislation in key areas that are relevant to the competition with China, for example. And I've had so many of our students and, and alumni research assistants say, you know, I never thought about the world the way that, that, that we thought about it in, in our research efforts. And I think that what we're doing is setting an example for, you know, for a, a counter uh, to what we see these days, which is this orthodoxy of the, the new left or post-colonial theory or these reified philosophies that teach our, our young people, I think, a couple of dangerous things. One is that they should be intolerant of other people's views, and the other is that they don't have agency. They can't build a better future for generations to come. And whenever you put the, the word like institutional or systemic in front of something, you're taking agency away from people. And so I, I think what you're left with, if you believe all of that, is a really toxic combination between anger and resignation. And so I think what we've been able to do with the COVID-19 project last year, and this is on YouTube, and our, our students are the ones presenting the, the outcome of that, of that research is I think you rekindle or you kindle in, in, uh, in the younger generation a sense that they can make a difference. Speaking of toxic, John, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about economics and Washington, D.C. Only a couple of minutes? Washington. <laughs> um, you've been blogging a lot about Build Back Better. Um, explain to me, Professor Cochran, the logic behind taxing unrealized income. In other words, money that doesn't exist to pay for a bill that we don't know what's in it. <laughs> or is that too simplistic of a read? Well, you said explain. So uh, my mother taught me always to try to say something nice. So before we <laughs> go on, I'll try to say something nice. There is actually a, a very interesting theorem in economics. The perfect tax is the one-time wealth tax. Uh, grab the wealth and promise never, ever to do it again because the wealth is there and then you don't have any disincentive effects. Now, you can see how that theory, it's a beautiful theory, does not apply to the current situation because this is certainly not a tax that is going to be done once and forever. Uh, and it is not a tax being talked about to fund a one-time, once-in-two-centuries emergency. It's to, to fund a continuing expansion of the welfare state. And even the billionaires don't have that much money, so it's actually not going to have much revenue. This, this particular tax, uh, we could go on about it, but it takes like 30 seconds to say, well, what about unrealized capital losses? Well, won't they just take their companies private and we'll spend the next uh, 50 years with their lawyers discussing what they're worth? Uh, won't this have disincentive effects? Obviously. It's, it's, it, it, the real interesting thing about it is not the details of this tax proposal, because there are no details of this tax proposal. The interesting thing is you guys have been at this for 90 years. Uh, I'm going to count that, well, 1917 actually is when the in income tax came in, so uh, more than 100 years. This is the best you got? Uh, you know, a, a cooked up last minute thing that an undergraduate can see through and see the problems with it. Uh, so the, the, uh, the striking incompetence of the whole Build Back Better bill, including the tax provisions, the, the last minute cobbling together, you know, where, where's the back bench? There's a, there's a lot of liberal think tanks out there. Right. Don't you guys have concrete, well thought out tax proposals that aren't full of obvious disincentives and loopholes just ready to go? Uh, apparently not, or no one's listening to them. 
So the incompetence of it is, is uh, striking uh, commentary on today's Washington. And of course, where we are is we are at the end of the income tax. Uh, the idea of taxing income doesn't really make much sense after all. Why did we do it? Because the government could do it. <laughs> the government taxes what it can tax. But it's kind of run out of how much uh, revenue you can, you can actually get out of it, as you can see by the machinations. The sad reality is if you want a 1970s style European welfare state, uh, you better have European taxes. And the, you're just not going to get this amount of money from anything out of an income tax. Yeah, if you want this kind of a welfare state, you're going to need a value-added tax and a 40% payroll tax. That's what Europe pays. 40% off the top on your wages, 20% on everything you buy in the stores. Uh, Middle-class taxes for middle-class benefits. And I said 1970s. Uh, actually, the European welfare state is a lot better constructed <laughs> than what we're going after. They actually think about disincentives a little more than we do. Uh, we're, we're doing the, the, the ones that really fell apart. Uh, so that's the end. There ain't, there ain't enough money here, and uh, sooner or later, we're either going to have a debt crisis or we're going to stop spending like drunken sailors. We're going to reform the structure of the welfare state, not to be so chaotically inefficient, or we're going to pass a wealth tax. A, a, sorry, not a wealth tax, a value-added tax or a, uh, and a payroll tax. It's yep. worth adding that, just to remind you, that the current deficit for this year is estimated by the Congressional Budget Office to be 13.4% of gross domestic product. It's supposed to magically fall next year. I'll be very interested to see how far that, that happens. The federal debt in public hands, leaving aside the stuff the Fed bought, is over 100% of GDP. It's 103% according to the CBO. But get this, that's the level that it reached at the end of World War II. That was the peak, uh, after which the federal government began to run pri primary surpluses, the economy grew, there was modest inflation, and the debt burden declined. But if you look at the CBO's long-run projections from here till 2051, that debt-to-GDP ratio is set to double, taking it up above 200% by 2051. We are on a completely unsustainable fiscal path. And what is really shocking to me is that the Democrats should have proceeded with extraordinarily lavish spending bills, even when one of the grand masters of the Democratic Party's economics establishment, Larry Summers, was warning in February, you are going to overheat the economy and you are going to create an inflation problem. They press on with this. And as John said, without any credible answer to the question, how do you pay for this, short of doubling the debt to GDP ratio. And the reason that we're in this mess is not a lack of deep thought in liberal think tanks. It is because they could not honestly tell the American people last year, in order to do what we plan to do, we are going to have to have a significant raise in taxes for everybody. There'll be a value added tax or something of that nature. They told the big lie that the super rich would pay for everything. And the reality is that that lie is going to be exposed in the coming days. They may be able to cobble something together uh, in the great sausage-making machine. But let's talk about the politics for a minute. At the beginning of this administration, we were told it's going to be transformative. Right. I heard people draw comparisons with Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson. I'm looking at the majorities that they have in, in Congress. I'm like, you can't be transformative with wafer-thin or non-existent majorities. So they've, they've embarked on what was obviously going to fail politically, quite apart from its adverse economic consequences. Right. So could, could I, I just want to add, add two, two quick things. Uh, when we talk about how much spending, in the newspapers, the headline is, oh, Joe Biden says 1.75 trillion or whatever. These spending numbers are completely made up. The, the amount of money that is going to be spent on these bills has nothing to do with what they're telling you. I'll, I'll give you one little example. The child care tax credit, which I looked up, we're going to spend X on it according to the headline bills. Well, that's the first three years, first of all. Secondly, it says this is an entitlement. Every American family has the right to child care at X percent of their income. How much is going to be spent on it? Read the text of the bill. Well, you know, 20 billion this year, 40 billion next year, and then monies as shall be required to fund this program. So the amount, the, the, the spending numbers you are reading are simply fantasy. It's going to be way more than that. And the Congressional Budget Office, the debt things, those projections are if nothing goes wrong. <laughs> those and, projections and, 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 uh, look, look, pretty, look pretty bad in 2006. And then, you know, we had 
a financial crisis, and then a decade later we have a pandemic. If nothing goes wrong, it only explodes like going up, a, going up the reverse side of a ski jump. If 10 years from now we have another pandemic and blow out another uh, $10 trillion, or if China invades Taiwan and we discover we need to buy some aircraft carriers, <laughs> it gets even worse. And of course, you know, the pressure is going to be most, uh, you know, f first of all, on non-discretionary spending and on defense, which is a minuscule part of the overall budget. And so what we could have is we could have a, a, a weakened uh, economy, growing debt, uh, and, and really um, a degradation of our defense capabilities at the same time. And uh, I think that's a, a big concern. And, and I think a lot of these projections you know, on, the, on the debt are based on you know, pretty low uh, assumptions about pretty low interest rates as well. And as the interest rates go up, uh, that the pressure on non-discretionary spending will be that that's what's going to happen first in terms of the, the, the federal budget. Let's do a right, lightning round series of questions here. I'm going to ask each one of you a question, and let's try to get a very quick answer. Start with you, Neil. Facebook changing its name to Meta. Big deal, little deal. What are they thinking? Well, this is the kind of last resort, isn't it? When you've suffered really serious reputational damage as a business, uh, you decide uh, to give yourself a new name, and everybody will magically forget about all the bad things that Facebook has done. Uh, I watched uh, Mark Zuckerberg's video introducing us to the metaverse yesterday. And if you haven't watched it, I strongly urge you to. We'll teach you a couple of things. Uh, one, that we are now at dystopia. We've arrived at dystopia, it was visualized by the science fiction author Neil Stevenson back in the 1990s in a wonderful novel called Snow Crash, in which he imagined that in a largely dilapidated California, citizens would be distracted from the uh, shocking state of daily life by spending half their lives in online virtual environments where their avatars had a good time, even if they themselves were leading utterly miserable lives. <laughs> so we are now there. Snow crash is, uh, is happening. The second thing you'll learn from this video is how not to use your hands when you're presenting, <laughs> because Mark Zuckerberg does this in an incredibly weird way so that his avatar looks more real realistically human than he does. <laughs> so good luck with the rebrand, Zuck. Uh, but my, my hunch is it doesn't solve the fundamental problem, which is, before we even get into the appeal or lack of appeal of virtual reality, that Facebook has done an immense number of harmful things knowingly. I mean, if you learn anything from the whistleblower, it is that they knew all the adverse effects of their products. And let me just give you one example where I think we can concretely say significant harm arose because of the way in which the platform was run. They knew, and we've known since before the pandemic, that anti-vax conspiracy theories proliferate uh, on Facebook's apps, particularly but not exclusively on WhatsApp. Uh, Renny DeResa, our colleague across the road at the Internet Observatory, pointed work. out that the anti-vax conspiracy theory was well established online prior to 2020. If you think about all the people who've died prematurely in the course of this year since vaccines became abundantly available, a large part of the responsibility for those unnecessary avoidable deaths must lie with the big tech companies. It's not just Facebook. Facebook is the fall guy for the whole of, of Silicon Valley. But the irresponsibility with which the Facebook platforms have been managed, to me, is, is a deeply shocking thing. Now, there's no simple answer as to what we do, because I don't personally believe antitrust is going to solve it. And that's what the Democrats have decided to do. But that there is a really profound problem with the way the network platforms have come to dominate the public sphere cannot be in doubt. And if you still are not convinced, uh, and I have friends who are always a little bit skeptical when I go after Facebook, let's just remember what happened in January of this year. The President of the United States, you can criticize him as much as you like, but he was the President of the United States, was canceled, removed from the internet as a result of decisions taken by a handful of people, including Mark Zuckerberg, but also Jeff Bezos and the leaders of the other big tech companies. There was a coup in this country. That was it. And I still cannot believe that liberal friends regard it as a good thing. 
that a handful of tech companies can have the power to remove the President of the United States from the public sphere as completely as the tech companies did in January. That's still, to me, a deeply shocking thing. And we have got to come up to, with a solution to that problem for the sake of the health of our democracy. So I, I want to ask Neil a, a follow-up question here. And now you know what... <laughs> Now you know what lightning round means for the good fellows. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let's see what happens if Neil asks. No, give us a longer answer. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, no, no. That was great, Neil, and I, and I appreciate where you went because beautifully stated. Um, but uh, uh, I want, looking, yes, there's, this is sort of like Philip Morris becoming Altria. But as a, a business question, well, first of all, so much for the idea that American companies Black are short-termists and only look at t today's bottom line. Uh, Facebook says they're gonna spend billions and billions of dollars on this virtual reality sort of thing. Now, is that the courageous visionary investment of the internet in the future, or is that a classic of companies completely burning cash and wasting it on some dream? I think it may turn out to be the latter because already Facebook's lunch is being eaten by TikTok. This was my segue into uh, HR because there's a national strategic, national security aspect to this. But you have the sense that you're really watching a kind of epic train wreck as they embark on uh, this massive investment. I, I myself have no desire whatsoever to enter virtual reality. I find actual reality weird enough. <laughs> so please do not give me those goggles. I do not want them for Christmas. I will not use them. Hey, I, I just say there's, there's a, a really, it's, it's worse, I guess, is what I would say, because uh, the, the incentive structure uh, is, is set in terms of these companies, and, and the incentive structure is to get more and more advertising dollars, and to do that by getting more and more clicks, and the way you get more and more clicks is you show people who are predisposed in a certain direction more and more extreme information. And so the, the effect that it's having on our society, obviously, is one of polarization, pitting us against each other, and reducing our confidence in our common identity as Americans and our confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. And that's what our rivals want more than anything. The Russians don't care who wins our elections as long as a large number of Americans doubt the legitimacy of the result. Now, it's even worse than that, though, because even though this, you know, the, the, the way that social media is, is operating in the information environment broadly, I would say even in the mainstream media and in the pseudo media, is, 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 is pulling us down, reducing our confidence, fragmenting us, authoritarian regimes are harnessing these technologies for their purpose to gather our children's data, our society's data, if it's TikTok, for example, but then to police our thoughts and to change our perceptions over time. So the algorithms it, that, that, uh, you know, that TikTok uses will, will change our children's perception over time. I mean, I, I, we were talking about this last night and somebody said, imagine if the Russians controlled all the cartoon programming for Saturday mornings a few decades ago, and that's what our children watched. That's the, the evolution that, that we're seeing. So we're seeing really the consolidation of power and a degree of strength and social cohesion in, in totalitarian regimes whereas we are allowing these companies to fragment ourselves and weaken us relative to them. Uh, wait, so I gotta put in, I'm not so sure there's as much cohesion. If you are a totalitarian regime, you are that because you don't have cohesion and you yeah, know- I, Yeah, I, I'm not long on totalitarianism, but believe I, me. I wanna- yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I, I think it's a sign of weakness and, and, and fragility, but it is also a mechanism of control, yeah. right? It's a mechanism of control. But I wanna put in a, a word for freedom. That's actually, you know, our, our uh, <laughs> freedom and competition, that's our, our motto around here. The jump, I entirely agree with Neil on the dangers of what's going on, but of course the response is, well, we need to regulate it. And this poses such an appetizing idea for the government because what would you want if you're in government than to regulate and be able to say who Facebook can and can't uh, put up. It's just, this is delicious. Yes, we'll regulate you, and the FTC will decide whether your rules for whether Trump gets to speak or Biden gets to speak are right. This is, this is exactly what polit politicians want in order to turn this into a protected, regulated place where only the official word can go out. So the idea of regulating it goes exactly the wrong way. The yeah, only I'll, answer yeah. is competition. 
Uh, we we uh, unregulated so that new social media companies can come in and clean these people's clocks because we've seen how dysfunctional uh, they are. People understand they're being lied to. People don't like to have their stuff censored. So regulation is going to take us exactly the wrong direction. Well, and you're seeing an extreme form of regulation in Xi Jinping's crackdown on the tech sector in China. And I think Xi Jinping looked at Jack Dorsey you know, and, and, uh, and looked at Mark Zuckerberg and what they did to Donald Trump and said, man, uh, the tech sector in China is not doing that to me. You know, and he's looking at Jack Ma, you know, watching NBA games courtside and decided, hey, I'm going I'm to cut these guys down. And, and uh, I think, I think there, there's a direct connection between what happened here uh, and then what Xi Jinping has done in the tech sector in China. And let's start with an unrealized capital gains tax. <laughs> <laughs> so in our ill-fated lightning round, I actually had a China question for you, HR. Uh, the question was this. General Milley, who seems to find a way back in the news every few weeks ago, he testified to Congress. He was talking about the Chinese hypersonic missile, and he suggested this might be the Sputnik of our time. In other words, a wake-up call for the United States, looking at a Cold War rival and thinking, my God, we're losing technology. Right. Is this Sputnik or not? Well, you know, I, I think we should hope it is, right? Because we, we haven't had kind of the wake-up call to recognize that we are in a, a very consequential, if not existential, competition with the Chinese Communist Party. And we vacated really critical arenas of competition in, in basic and applied research is in one of those areas and in, in defense modernization. You know, we have a huge bow wave of deferred defense modernization that goes back mainly to the Obama years when those defense budgets were being cut while we were still really deeply committed in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and we haven't caught up to it. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party, the People's Liberation Army, has, in, has increased their defense spending 800% since the mid-90s. I think it's a 42 or 44-fold increase since that time. And they've invested you know, in some of the capabilities that we have that have been our strengths, like they have one aircraft carrier. But what they did that was, I think, smart and dangerous is they invested in capabilities that could take apart our differential advantages. Hypersonic weapons is one of those. Long range precision fires capabilities like carrier killer missiles and so forth is another. Tiered and layered air defense, counter satellite, electronic warfare, undersea and, and aerial drones and swarm drone cap capabilities, offensive cyber. This is all meant to, to break apart our assured communications, our ability to conduct effective joint operations, which are operations across all domains, right? The maritime, the, the aerospace, the you know, land, uh, and, and, uh, and, and space and cyberspace. That's what we, our, our force does extremely well, and China has done everything it can to try to take that apart. And so what we need now are countermeasures to the countermeasures, right? There's never linear progress in war or between wars in terms of your military capabilities, right? You have a, the submarine was going to be decisive. Well, then the sonar, right? The bomber will always get through. Then the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. And now our exquisite system that has allowed, allowed smaller and smaller forces to have a bigger and bigger impact over wider areas is now vulnerable. And I think a lot of the assumptions that underpinned our defense modernization need to come into question. Uh, and, and especially the, the, the procurement of these fewer and fewer more exquisite systems that are prone maybe to catastrophic failure. We need forces that, that, that are maybe like us, you know, and degrade gracefully rather than, <laughs> rather than, rather than fail catastrophically. <laughs> Neil, actually, I had, a, I had a Chinese lightning round question for you, Neil. The most likely form of Chinese aggression against Taiwan, land, air, sea, or cyber? Well, they kind of already do cyber. It's important to realize that they already do cyber. Mm -hmm. uh, the big question, I'm going to keep it short, rem remembering the word lightning, lightning. <laughs> uh, is do they risk an all-out amphibious uh, assault? Now, I think Elbridge Colby did a very good piece in the Wall Street Journal just the other day, which is close to my view, namely that we are talking the talk at a time when we can't really walk the walk in terms of deterrence. We're creating an incentive for the Chinese to act sooner rather than later. You know, I said to Jim Stavridis uh, the other day, your, your book about the war scenario has the title 2034. The only thing I don't like about the book is that's 10 years later than I think this could happen. 
So the question is, uh, do they risk the all-out amphibious assault, or do they take a leaf out of President Putin's book and do something much more like the uh, Russian operation in Ukraine, where they don't seize the whole territory, they seize some outlying islands, uh, and then they send the little green men in. And my sense is that there's going to be something much more hybrid warfare about the way they do this, and not so much D-Day landings, which, which would be such a risky operation from their point of view that I'd be very surprised if they, if they tried it. But, you know... That's, that's yeah. the big question. The big strategic question of Cold War II really is Taiwan, because it combines, in Cold War I terms, the properties of Berlin, Cuba, and the Persian Gulf, all rolled into one. Remember the crucial importance of TSMC as the number one producer of high-end semiconductors. Right there, almost a reproach to the PRC, which can't produce those semiconductors. The stakes are amazingly high. I'm glad to say Hoover is doing a lot of excellent work on this. We had a terrific uh, uh, mini conference on Taiwan just the other day with some very impressive Taiwanese representatives. We think a lot about this issue. Credit to Larry Diamond and others for the work that they've done. But my sense is it's not D-Day that we should expect. It's something that could involve a much higher level of cyber than we've yet seen in any conflict. And that's the thing that scares me, because I suspect if it comes to the crunch that somewhere in the Pentagon, there's a 36-page cyber attack preparedness plan that will be just as good as the 36-page pandemic preparedness plan that we know they had at DHHS. Right. John, it's October the 29th. This is the anniversary of the stock market crash. What is the likelihood of 1929 occurring anytime soon? Well, <laughs> 30 seconds or less. <laughs> well, the one thing for sure is that it's hard to forecast the stock market. Yes. Uh, and Irving Fisher said in 1929, stocks are at a permanently higher plateau. Right. That was wrong. But on the other hand, you know, many sages have been saying the stock market's going to fall anytime. Sometime the stock market will fall. Will it come soon? Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, usually it comes on a piece of bad news. So I would say uh, China invading Taiwan might cause the stock market to collapse. Uh, so it trundles along till something bad happens. And so that's as much as I'm going to say, trundles along till something bad happens. We have just a couple minutes left, gentlemen. There's so much I wanted to get to. I wanted to find out when the three of you go out to dinner, who pays? <laughs> well, definitely not the Scotsman. I, I never seem to bring my wallet. <laughs> I don't know why that is. <laughs> well, the sad fact is, thanks to COVID, uh, we have not had the opportunity uh, to find out. So after, uh, after that uh, meeting at uh, Neil's favorite bar and a few too many uh, whiskeys, we'll find out who, uh, <laughs> who gets It's important to record before I... Uh, slander myself, that the first dinner we had in real space as the Goodfellows was at my home. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, is, that is on on us. And it's much cheaper to do it that way, folks, than I'm to up, go I'm up next. I'm up next. We've been to John's too, so. It's your Goodfellows karaoke night. What's your go-to song? <laughs> <laughs> Love Shack. <laughs> How could it not? How could it not be? How could it not be? <laughs> God help us. Final question, since we have just about two minutes left here. Just best, best thing about being a Hoover Institution senior fellow. Talking to you guys. Yeah. I think to be part of an institution that just over a century ago was set up to learn the lessons of war, peace, and revolution. That's exactly what I set out to do when I was about 15, and I just finished reading War and Peace. And I've searched my whole life for an institution that's serious about this. I didn't really find it in Oxford. I didn't really find it in Cambridge. I didn't really find it at Harvard. And I found it, I found it here. And it's yeah. tremendously exciting to be able to do this work. The fantastic thing is that this is the Applied History Institution. That's what Hoover had in mind. And, and so finally, I've kind of found an intellectual home. That's the best thing for me. Hey, Joe? Yeah, I'll say this is not to plug battlegrounds, but I, I mean, the last three paragraphs of the book, I think I described that I could not, I couldn't have, have written this book, that book anywhere else but here in this environment with these great colleagues. I remember Neil's advice when I started, he said, you need to just start writing, just go, go up there and start writing, <laughs> which I did. Uh, and then, and then of course, benefited from, from criticisms from, from my colleagues. I've got, had great research assistants, these amazing students here at Stanford. So I, I really think it is, it's the environment overall it's a creative, imaginative, exciting environment to be in. You know, much more exciting than a monastery, I think. And being under constant attack from the, uh, from the surrounding <laughs> institution is actually quite good. It focuses the mind. It's a bit like being Taiwan. Uh, 
being shot at is invigorating, right? <laughs> yes. John, the best part about being a senior fellow here? Uh, what's the best part about heaven? Um, <laughs> this is a, this, um, it provides, so people who sort of live alone on mountaintops don't produce anything worth reading. This provides the institutional support that's been ideal for me to produce what I'm producing, which uh, com the combination of scholarship and policy engagement mm -hmm. uh, and the time to do it, uh, free of a lot of the junk that we had to do as academics. Hoover still has one big problem. There's only 24 hours in a day. And, and let's get Condi working on that one. <laughs> okay, and with that, we're going to conclude this episode of Goodfellows, but fear not, we'll be back soon with a new conversation, a new topic. Until then, on behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, John Cochran, a lot of people in this audience who you cannot see, but trust me, they are here. You've heard their applause. Thanks for watching. On behalf of all of us, take care of yourselves. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks, If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.